We're going to continue our study this morning on tearing down strongholds, thinking, believing, confessing. And we'll go to our um, uh, foundation scripture again. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 7. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 7, New Living Translation. We are human, but we don't wage war with human plans and methods. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. With these weapons, we break down every proud argument that keeps people from knowing God. With these weapons, we conquer their rebellious ideas and teach them to obey Christ. And we will punish those who remain disobedient after the rest of you became loyal and obedient. Look at the obvious facts. Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as you do. So we're looking at strongholds. Number one, accept, believe, and receive God's word as truth. Accept means to believe or come to recognize as valid or correct. We have to realize that God's word is truth. There's no truth outside of God's word. None. Zero. There might be facts, but the facts have got to change. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me, so there's no other way to get to God but by Jesus. And his word is truth. And it's the truth in John 8. It says the truth will make us free. So um, then one, we saw that God's word is truth. That's the only truth. Number two, we saw that there's two kingdoms. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't be like the heathen who operate in the kingdom of this world. Satan is God of this world system. Not of the earth. He doesn't own the earth. He's God of the world system. So there's two kingdoms. There's God's kingdom and there's the world's kingdom of which Satan is Lord. And so when we're tearing down strongholds, what we're doing is we're coming against the thoughts of this world, the way the world does things, the way the world thinks, and changing it to the way God thinks. So we had looked at that. We saw that we're, to, we're translated, Colossians says, we're translated out of darkness into light. So I, my question was, what kingdom are you promoting with your time and resources? We have to realize that Jesus put Satan to naught, and naught means no thing. So there's no thing that Satan has power over us in. He cannot control us. He cannot force us. The problem is when we're deceived and we don't cast down imaginations or thoughts, then we allow him to infiltrate our mind and we go dictate to us and tell us how to overcome in a situation. They don't know because we're spirit, soul, and body. And the world deals with your soul and your body. They have no idea about the spirit realm. So we saw that we're translated out of darkness or out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We saw we're to run our race, we're to press, fight the good fight of faith, contend, defend, fight for, engage in a competition for. Then we saw that bad choices lead to toxic thinking. Proverbs says, he who heeds Instruction and correction is not only himself in the way of life, but also is a way of life for others. When we walk in the word of God, we're a way of life. We're a light to others. And when we reject or refuse reproof, we not only ourselves go astray, but also those that we have dealings with, we cause to go astray. The impact of toxic thinking research shows that 75 to 98% of mental, physical, and behavioral illnesses come from our thought life. So let, I'm going to read this attitude thing again. Attitude, positive or negative. Life goes in the direction of our most dominant thought. Remember, what our dominant thought, whatever is our main thought. Words produce our thinking. Our thinking will produce our emotions or feelings. Our emotions or feelings will produce our decisions. 
Our decisions will produce our actions. Our actions will produce our habits. Our habits will produce our character. Our character will bring us to our destiny. The negative. Negative words produce negative thinking. Negative thinking will produce negative emotions. Negative emotions will produce negative decisions. Negative decisions will produce negative actions. Negative actions will produce negative habits. Negative habits will produce negative character. Negative character will bring you to the wrong or negative destination. So when you're starting to feel all negative and everything around you seems negative, change what you're thinking. It's easy to blame other people for the way we feel. But the way we feel is directly related to how we think. We don't get all emotional without a thought. I can't be thinking wonderful thoughts and then feel sad and negative and unhappy. And remember, I read 75... Well, I did read it. Oh, it's right in my hand. All right, then. Research shows that 75 to 98% of medical, mental, physical, and behavioral illnesses come from our thought life. So it's when we can, we don't need other people to tell us. If we are in a negative flow or feeling negative or feeling down, it's because of our thoughts. We can deal with circumstances and situations by applying the word of God to it. And a merry heart does good like a medicine. Because it is a press. People want everything lovely. And as soon as there's a press, we think, oh, God's gone. I don't feel him. There is a work to fighting the good fight of faith. You have to press. You're pressing Satan is doing everything he can to stop you. So let's see. Since the strongholds are created by sense or carnal thoughts, these lies create mental and emotional strongholds. And then we saw where to cast down, pull down, demolish subtle reasoning of the adversary. Imaginations, a reasoning such as is hostile to the Christian faith, take captive... Just incarcerate those thoughts. We're to take thoughts captive, not the devil. The devil is not going to be incarcerated until Jesus comes back. He'll be put away for a thousand years, then he'll be released, and then after that he's going to go forever. Until that time, he is not going to be incarcerated, and there's no point in screaming at the devil to be incarcerated. He is not. We take authority over him. Main way is our thoughts and speaking the word of God. So, um, let's look, let's kind of start here today. That was just a really quick review, and I know I talked fast, but that's all right. Uh, let's look at First Thessalonians 5. Somebody say Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Um, the King James says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. The New Living Translation of verse 3, when people are saying all is well, everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall upon them as suddenly as a woman's birth pains begin when her child is about to be born and there will be no escape. Now, I understand a lot of that's referring to um, the rapture, the end times, etc. But I want to take this and reading the whole thing because we're children of light, not darkness. And we've already previously studied those other scriptures pertaining to that. There is this idea that everything's nice around us. And so then we're lulled into this sleep. And everything seems peaceful. 
And then all of a sudden, bango, you hit the wall. And now you're scrambling. What do I do? I don't know if anybody's walked into a wall or something in the dark and you're walking into something and it makes you go back. I remember one time I was walking down a sidewalk with some friends and we were busy chatting and it was a wooden sidewalk and we were going to go swimming and I walked into a light post because I was so busy talking. It set me back. It also set me back financially because my money fell and went through the cracks and we were on our way to Vic Pool at the time. You see, when you're not watching where you're going, you're going to run into a wall. And if you're not fighting the good fight of faith, casting down imaginations, you're going to run into a wall and you won't know where you're going. There's only one way to know where you're going, and that's with the word of God. So when you get this sense of peace and everybody's saying, it's all right, it's okay, just know there's a problem. It said, many are the temptations, tests, and trials of a righteous child. Many. And the thing is, if we're staying on guard like we're supposed to, by speaking the word of God, we're releasing our angels, we won't get caught unaware. The word says we won't get caught unaware. It's only when we kick back and think everything's fine, and I don't have to do anything, we will get caught unaware. And I remember some time ago, Charles Cap said, build your foundation and keep working on it. It's easier to pour concrete for your foundation when it's dry than in a flood. And how many agree? When you're in the midst of a big deal, it's hard to get back at it. But if you've already planted that foundation in you and you're working it all the time, it's just like... You know Satan's been come to naught, so it's just like a fly. You just, you're gone. And that's the casting down of imaginations. You see, we have to identify our enemy and how he works. And he doesn't come dressed in ugly clothes or a red suit. He can disguise himself as an angel of light, and we're going to get into that and how to recognize that, maybe today, but we'll work our way there. But if we don't know how he operates, we will never be able to stop him and come against him. And we have all kinds of crazy ideas on how Satan operates. Number one, everybody say, Satan has been defeated by Jesus He has been brought to naught. He has zero authority over me because Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you go. Number one, you don't pray for the devil, Jesus to do something about the devil. He's done all he's going to do. Satan's only weapon, and we find that in Genesis chapter 3, is when he spoke to Eve and got her eyes focusing on what she shouldn't have. And then she realized that what she was looking at might be good. He does it through thoughts, either our own or from other people. It can be somebody that you trust and think are so great, and they come up and say, you know, I'm just speaking this over you, and this is what it should be. Well, if God hasn't said it, just say thank you very much, put it on a shelf, and continue. All people can be misled. Whether it's you, Pastor David, myself, your parents, whosoever. Judge everything according to the word of God, and you won't be deceived. That's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. So one big problem, one, so I found, we found out, we identify how the enemy works and he works through thoughts. He wants to strip you of your authority, make you think you have no power against him. Luke 10, 19, I believe it is. Jesus said, I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, everybody say all, all, how much? 
once it's all, is there anything left after all? All the power of the enemy. All. We've been given it all. Yeah, that's a good time to shout. So when somebody comes along or Satan comes along and says, you're just not going to make it, is that a truth or a lie? It's a lie. You know that. He has zero authority to enforce in your life. None. This is so important to remember. Because people are talking and reacting to the devil as though he's riding this white horse. And, and he's king of the mountain. He wants you to think he's king of the mountain. But he really, his authority, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places far above all principality, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places. Where, where he, that means under our feet. He's under our feet. His authority is under our, our authority. Our authority that we have from Jesus is above the devil's authority. Hallelujah. So that's a stronghold we have to tear down that he's this person that's so wonderful. He's lost all his authority. He's a thief. And he cannot work in this earth except through a body. You wonder why some people are so crazy because they've given themselves over to the devil. If Satan couldn't get anybody to cooperate with him, there would be nothing ugly in this earth. He needs people to work through. You cannot operate in this world without an earth suit. And your earth suit is your body. So now, let's go back to, we're going to look at Romans 11. Romans 11. Another, as you're going there, Romans 11. There is this false sense of security often with the world system where they look at the situation and then they say, if you do this and this and this, everything will be okay. But the world system doesn't have your answer. The word of God has your answer. Because they're treating your body and your soul. They don't know you're a spirit person. And they're treating it according to what the world would do. And eventually, when they don't know what to do, they give you drugs. They do. I mean, they do. And, and, and you go there and they say, well, then it must be this and it must be that. Well, how about if we try this drug? And then you get this long list. If you take it, it could kill you. So what are the, what's worse? You know, the symptoms are so bad. I'm not telling anybody to get off their medication. We're not talking about that. But when you have a problem and you go, they want to try and examine your mind. And one of the favorite things they like to do is make you go back in your past and go through all this trash that Jesus has redeemed you from. And the more you talk about your problem, the worse it's going to get and the more real it's going to be. We don't have problems. We have answers by the Holy Ghost. It's a problem when people go back over the same stuff over and over and over. Because it gets bigger and bigger and more real and more real. And eventually, it's blowing right out of proportion. We don't speak the problem. We speak the word of God and command that problem to change. Like I said before, if you want the cat, you're not going to call the dog. Why would you call the dog if you want the cat? But that's what we're doing. We want healing and we're calling sickness. We're going, you know, you want the dog, but you're going, here kitty, here kitty. And the dog is over there and you can't understand why the dog's not coming. We want healing. We're going, hey sickness, hey, I've got sickness, I've got this, I've got that. 
Oh, why doesn't God heal me? What are you calling? What do you want in your life? You see, calling sickness is a stronghold. Speaking sickness and disease and your problems is a stronghold. And we have to get rid of that stronghold and pull it down. And so we started seeing how to pull strongholds down and we went to Romans 11. Romans 11, I'm going to read New Living Translation, 1136. We're reading uh, starting verse 36 because in uh, chapter 12, verse 1, Paul goes, therefore. And so we want to know why he's saying therefore, because if there's a therefore, you should find out what it's there for. So we're looking at Romans 11, 36 first. For everything comes from him. Everything exists by his power and is intended for his glory. Everybody say, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I glorify God in my body, which is his. Now, we had really looked at this a lot last week, so I'm just going to go quick. Our body is one of our most valuable assets. Now, we saw, and and I'm not going to those scriptures. You can get a CD from last week if you want, but um, we're not our own. We like to think, it's my body, I can do with it what I want. Well, you can. But Jesus paid a price for your body. He says, I paid a price for it. I shed my blood for it. I allowed my body to be beaten and bruised and stripes. I purchased your body with my blood. It belongs to me. We're to glorify God in our body, and that's what that... Verse 36 backs up, and we saw that. Now, I want to say something else. This is interesting. Your body, everybody say my body, body. is God's address on planet Earth. He doesn't have any other address. He's not out there floating around. It says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. His residence is within every born-again believer. So where I go, Holy Spirit goes. Everywhere I go. Everything I look at, Holy Spirit looks at. Now, when you look and read Solomon's temple and even the tabernacle in the wilderness, the things they did to make it so beautiful... For the Shekinah glory in the holy of holies. Our body houses the Shekinah glory of God. It says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What you do to your body is very, very important. How you look after your body is very important. To the point where, let's read... Verse 1 of chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, and he's begging you, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable that you present your body to God. You see, the vessel takes its value from what is in it. Now, if I had, I, I should have gotten two juice containers, one with water and the other full of paper towel. Now, if you've been in the desert and you're dying of thirst, which juice container is more valuable? The water. Which one would you pay the higher price for? The water. The juice jugs are the same. They're of the same value. The containers are the same value. But what's in it changes the value. And if you're born again, a child of God, your body's his temple. And your body is valuable to him. And we have got to treat it that way. We're just not a hunk of flesh. Just slap it down. 
These bodies will be resurrected. They will be glorified. But while we're walking on this earth, this is God's address. And what I put in it and how I treat it shows my respect for the price he paid for my body. Um, Psalms 139, 13 to 14. I'm just going to read it on the New Living. Um, you made, listen, so never criticize your body. Never criticize how you look. Listen to this. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. We read that last week, and every time I read it, it's even more overwhelming. And don't ever criticize. And I know none of you would. But other people listen to these CDs, so I'm going to put it on there. Don't ever criticize the way someone looks. They were wonderfully, marvelously made. And we're not to judge people by how they look. God said man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. Amen. And unfortunately, there's that pressure. I think the student, all the kids that went upstairs need to be told, and I'm telling you, don't let people in school pressure you to look a certain way, that you have to act a certain way, that you have to consume certain things to be with the in crowd. Let me tell you, you're with the in crowd, Jesus. Hallelujah. He's given you all power, all authority. Amen. You walk in your authority and your victory, it will draw this other. It's just like you're setting out a honey pot and the flies are going to come. Don't allow yourself to be contaminated through peer pressure. At work, don't allow yourself to be pushed. And I'm not talking about going there and being weird. There's a lot of weird Christians. We're not talking about being weird. We're talking about being the light. Loving, kind, Saying good things to people. Building people up. Encouraging. Hallelujah. So it's our job and responsibility to watch over our body and protect it. And we found out last week that we're to train our body. Our bodies can be trained. So we found that out. We found out our body's not meant for sin. Now here, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, please. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Well, you know what? I think we should... No, we'll just go right there. Just right to 5.23. King James, and the very God of peace, sanctify means set you apart holy. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. New Living Translation. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until that day when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Now we're keeping our body holy and blameless So we, we look at that and wonder, what, what, what does it mean? How can I keep my body blameless? We're going to get to the mind. I don't know if we're going to get to the mind today. Maybe not. But anyway, how do I keep my body blameless? Well, when you go further up a ways in that chapter, it says in verse uh, 15, tells us something to do. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. 15, 16, rejoice evermore. Well, when you're rejoicing, it's pretty hard 
to do things thinking-wise to contaminate your soul realm or your body. Pray without ceasing. In everything gives thanks. Now I want to say here, in every situation give thanks. But you don't give thanks for the works of the devil. Come on now. Because I've heard people say, oh, bless the Lord. Oh, the devil did this and that. Bless his holy name. Oh, I praise the Lord. The devil broke my leg. Come on. Our body's to be kept blameless, so what are we supposed to do? We're to pray for our leg to be healed. Amen. That's keeping our body blameless. We give thanks. So, so Satan's coming against me all. Hell's broken loose in my life. What do I do? Father, I thank you. I thank you that the wisdom of God dwells richly within me. I thank you that you show me what to do to get out of this situation. You show me what the root of the problem is. I rejoice and thank you that I have the answer. That's how we give thanks in everything, not for. You never give thanks for a situation that's wrong because then you're stuck in it. That's like calling the cat instead of the dog. You give thanks for the answer. You need healing, you give thanks that you're healed. You need a sound mind, he's given us the spirit of a sound mind, you thank him for it. You need money to pay your bills, you put your hand on it and say, Father, I thank you, you meet all my needs in the name of Jesus, I call this debt done. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. The New Living Translation is keeping our whole spirit and soul blameless until Jesus comes. That means we can be whole, sound. Our spirit, of course, it is when we're born again. We, we become the righteousness of God in Christ. Our soul, which we're going to get at next, is our mind, will, and emotions, and our body should be healed, walking in divine health. And I believe we're getting there. We're getting there. I see it, the body of Christ walking in divine health. No sickness, no disease coming upon us. Might try, but it won't. It will not be able to attach itself to our bodies. Because why? We're just going to sort of introduce this. Um, let's go back to Romans chapter 12. So part of, cast, of tearing down and casting down strongholds is presenting our body. Because if we don't train our body, we're going to allow our body to dictate to us and do things and want things it shouldn't. And it's going to be hard to tear down that stronghold. So in Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um... New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Oh, that's huge. You know, the body of Christ has its own culture, its own customs. And we get so confused with what a culture is. And we think culture is the way we dress, the way we look the way we eat. No, that's not your culture. That's just habits you form because you were raised with it. I remember when David came, I made him a lunch once, and I'm not going to tell you what I put on it. But anyway, I made it, and it was one of the things that we always ate at home, and we thought it was really good. And he just tried to be nice, but it boiled down to he, yuck. He did not like it at all, and asked me never to do that again. 
well, fine. You see, but that wasn't him and that wasn't... He didn't reject me by rejecting the food I gave him. Come on. You see, we all eat the same food in that we share communion. That's what's important. The rest doesn't matter. I don't care what you eat. Well, that's not true. I don't care because I cast my care on the Lord, but I want you all to eat healthy and live long. Let's put it that way. I do. That's my desire for everyone. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. The renewing of the mind brings the will into agreement with the Father's will. As we fill our minds with his word, we then begin to think as he thinks, and his ways become our ways. We become, through his power and wisdom, a master of the circumstances of life. How many want to be masters of the circumstances of life? Well, there's only one way. Think like God thinks. Because then you'll act like God acts. And you'll do what God does. And in Ephesians, it says, be imitators of God as dear children. So I'm not telling you to do something that's wild to imitate God and copy God. He says, imitate me. You're my children. You act, you walk, you talk, you do what I do. Jesus said, the works that I did, you will do. Everybody should be expecting. It says in Mark 16 that we will speak with new tongues, we'll cast out devils, we'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. That's our job. That's what we're to do. We're to think like God thinks. Now... What is God's will? And often when we think about that, we think, hmm, should I be a doctor, a lawyer? Uh, Should I be a student? Should I be this? Should I be that? Well, that is his plan. I call that his plan for your life. What's his will? The blessing. The blessing. The blessing, which is the gospel which is the good news, which is Genesis 128. And he blessed them and said, blessed is not just an inactive word, it's an empowerment. And he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and take dominion. That's his will. So where does sickness and disease fall in? He wants us to subdue it. Healing's his will. Prosperity's his will. A sound mind's his will. That's his will. That's his will. For every single person that's been bought with a price. He wants us to think like he thinks. Sickness and disease was such a curse that Jesus came and bore it in his body. So we might be free from it so that that blessing comes on us. We have got to take authority, subdue, And take dominion over every sickness and disease. Jesus became poor that we might be rich. We are to take authority over every bit of poverty that comes upon our life. When you read the curse, Galatians 3.13 says that the blessing of Abraham, 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. The curse and the blessing is in Deuteronomy chapter 28. You read those curses. Those curses have no right in the body of Christ because we've been redeemed from them. Hallelujah. 
We have been redeemed, bought out of sickness and disease, bought out of poverty and despair. And I want you to get so stirred up when you see the price Jesus paid. When you understand what he did and how he redeemed you. I want you to see how you were crucified with him. And in being crucified with him, it's like all that curse that belonged to you. It was put on him and he took yours and you were with him because that's who you were. And he defeated Satan and he ascended on the third day. He paid a price. He suffered and died. So you don't have to have any part of the curse. It's not being humble. To allow the works of the devil to infest you and your family. Oh, I'm just suffering for Jesus. No, you're not. You're being lazy and deceived. You have to fight the good fight of faith and it takes work. Because you have got to get into the word of God every day. Every day. Everybody say every day. Because Satan does not quit for a half an hour nap. He doesn't take five minutes off. And I know everybody's busy, but our schedules don't just happen. They are created by a series of established priorities. As each day passes, we form our priorities but what, by what we spend our time doing. What can possibly be more important than your time in the Word every day? And if you have to cut something else out to do it, you can. Just change your schedule. Change your priorities. Because if you don't, you're not going to walk in that place of victory because we have to know the word. But not having heard the word, not having known the word, but know it. We have to that fast and even faster the minute we hear something, we can immediately determine if that's the word from the Lord or if that's the way the world operates. If you don't know the word of God, You won't. And the only way you're going to do that is by changing your way of thinking. So that your way of thinking, for instance, if a sickness or disease comes against you, I don't sit there and go, boy, now I'm sick. I better get the word out and I'm going to have to speak the word. And I said it once and I said it twice. Number one, get in the word before you're sick. Build it in there. But if something tries to come against me, I realize this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I think back to to the temple, Solomon's temple. Would they allow some kind of disease in that temple? Of course not. They wouldn't allow it in. And in fact, if it did come in and got into the Holy of Holies where the glory was, it would just shrivel up and die. Well, when something comes against me, I see it as coming against the temple of God. How dare it? It has no power and no authority to come against the temple of the living God. How can it? Jesus paid for my body. It says, I was bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And it's time that we just Sit up, suck it up, and go forward with the word of God. Until we're at such a place that no harmful virus, no bacteria, no nothing can come against us. And we've all had to walk our way through it. With the children's eyes being healed, it wasn't that fast. It was word upon word. Ever since I was very young, I was in 
early elementary, I would have migraine headaches. And there's no cure until you find out about the blood. Now, I'd be out of commission for a, up to a week. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I found out about healing, and I started speaking it. And I started speaking it. And I got another headache. And I would be driving, and I would do whatever I had to do. And I would have a bag or something because I would be sick while I'm driving. And I never said I had a headache. I had healing. I was healed. I was healed. I didn't give that thing the right to exist in my body. And as I was going and asking for wisdom, I realized maybe some foods didn't quite work right. I had to eat more regularly because I, of my metabolism, the way I ate, things I ate. It's nice to be able to come, come and have somebody go up to you and, oh, you're going to heal. Oh, be healed in Jesus' name. And you're healed. Well, you would be. But you know what? If you keep living the same way, you're going to have it again and again and again and again until you get the word in your life for yourself. That's why renewing the mind. That's how you pull down strongholds. And it's not a once. I today... I haven't had a migraine, but they've tried a couple times. And there's been a couple times I thought, you know, it'd really be nice to just lay in the bed. I remember one time I had it, we were believing healing, and I told you this before. The boys came in. You're healed, Mom. Prayed over me. I said, thank you. So I'm laying there in the dark pain. They came back. Time and brain came back, said, Mom, healed people don't stay in bed. I thought, is that the love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost? I said, Right, I'll be there. I didn't say when, I'll be there. They come back again, Mom, healed people don't stay in bed and we're hungry. We'd like some supper. I figure, it figures, all they want Mom for is supper. Well, I got up. I didn't know how I was going to stand there. But within a very short period of time, all pain was gone. That's acting your faith. If you really believe you're healed, truly believe you're healed, you won't be in the bed. You will act as though you're healed. Come on. You will act. As though you're healed. Because you believe and know you're healed. When you're just starting off and you're not quite sure, stay in the bed. But keep feeding your faith and feeding your faith and feeding your faith. And feeding your faith. We came to a place when we were believing God for the children's eyes. Timon took his glasses off, said, I'm not wearing them anymore. Brent, the doctor, asked for his eye glasses. He said, sure, you can have them. I don't need them anyway. And they said to him, well, why? He said, Jesus, healed my eyes. The doctor came back, checked him, and said, who did you say healed your eyes? No, he wasn't a believer. Brent said, Jesus. He says, I don't doubt it. It, sometime, and I believe time, it's speeding up, it's speeding up, it's speeding up, it's speeding up, and it's faster and faster. But you've got to stand and fight the good fight of faith. And it isn't easy because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And we're in a day and age in society where we can pop pills for everything. And where it's fast food and microwave and everything's quick, quick, quick. And so we want God to get on our time schedule. When your faith is there, Jesus is as your faith, be it unto you. So that's why we're teaching this, to build your faith. Build your faith. Build your faith. Build it. Build it. Keep meditating it. So anytime anything happens, any thought comes that isn't in line with the will of God, with the word of God, you tear it down. Now, how do you tear it down? Okay, so sickness comes against me. How do I tear that thought down? The thought comes in, oh, Arlene, you're going to get another migraine. You just better settle in. 
And I had some medication at home and at church. And I didn't realize that it would expire. I don't know what it was, Advil, time, I don't know, one of those kind of things. And I, then somebody said something about, do you know this stuff expires? I thought, oh, really? So I checked my stuff at home. Well, it had expired for a few couple years, threw it away. And then I got the other one at the church here, and it had expired. And I remember buying it just shortly when we moved into the church. So I had to throw it all away. So then I'm shopping, and the thought comes, Arlene, you better get some more medication because get some more painkiller. What if, what if, what if? Now, if you're in that much pain, you might need to take some pain medication simply so you can stay in the word. But let me also tell you, check, there's a lot of natural substances you can take that are infl- get, that'll fight inflammation and pain. So anyway, you check those out. But the thought, so when that thought came, my immediate reaction wasn't, oh no, what am I going to do? I have service tonight. Who can I get? I think it was, who can I get to teach? Who can I get to pray? Who can I get to do all this stuff? I thought, Jesus never had a day when he couldn't minister. Because he was never sick. And if I'm his body, I'm never sick. So when something like that comes against you, if you know the will of God and you're thinking, so the thought comes, Arlene, you're going to have another migraine or whatever. I go, glory to God, Father. I thank you. I'm delivered and redeemed by the curse of the law. Jesus bore all of that for me. I am free from pain. I am free from migraine. They bow their knee to the name of Jesus. That fast. That fast. Now you're thinking like your heavenly father thinks. That's how you cast an imagination down. And Jesus said, take no thought saying. So never, ever say anything that doesn't line up with the word. And you say, well, what if I need you to agree with me in prayer? Because I've got a broken leg. Just say, you know what, I want you to agree with me, Pastor Arlene, that this leg is healed and it gets, and it's supernatural fast. I want you to agree with me, my shoulder is healed. I want you to agree with me, every harmful virus and bacteria dies instantly when it touches my body. Don't take ownership. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God, I know it's been a long morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.